Today we're going to have, I'm honored to say, Guy Training, a very busy and talented individual, is sharing his time and talents to show you some really cool cutting edge technology. We are going to have a couple sessions with him. Today it's going to be collaboration and assignments with iPads, but he's also doing an open educational resources uh, session coming up on March 13th. You want to sign up for that. I've got information that I'll leave in the back of the room to sign up for that. Also, um, Brian Moore has been kind enough to do a really cool session about creating ebooks. And if you missed that session or if you want to do a repeat, that's coming up and that's going to be on April 23rd. And again, you can sign up for these other sessions at training.unl.edu. Bring your friends, bring anybody you think that might be interested because they're really good. These sessions are always really cool. So um, with that, again, thank you guys for sharing your time and talent. I will put this in the back of the room. My contact information is on there. If there's anybody you think that might want to share something cool that they're doing, it doesn't have to be iPads, have them contact Brad or myself and we'd be happy to try to get a session signed up. If you guys are doing something cool you want to share, it doesn't have to be an hour. It can be just, you know, 15 to 30 minutes and we can, you know, it doesn't have to be a full hour session. We just want to share what we're doing and uh, learn from each other with these experiences. So thank you all. Thank you, Brad. Sure. And um, I do want to point out that there are no round tables here at all. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's it. Um, I'm going to talk about collaboration because I think that's something that uh, technology can afford in ways that are better. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something with me, and that is if there's anything, because I'm going to talk about, I was working through this and I came down with six things that I am using or going to use very shortly. And I wanted to share them with you. And if you have iPads here, I'd actually like to try and do this. I don't know how many will get through. But if everybody here thinks, you know, oh, we've all done this. We don't want to do this again, then we can move on. I don't have to wait on anything. But let's start uh, with this. I, I thought about this as, you know, first I had a, a title. And then I thought, so what does this mean for me? And I came down in collaboration. Um, you have to understand, in my context right now, we are in our, we are a year into having our first cohort of students. I teach in elementary education and all of our students are required to get tablets. Uh, they're not required to get iPads, by the way. And about one out of 30 in a, in, on average does not get an Apple product. And at least the one in my class uh, just went and got an Apple product. After a year in the program, he said, I'm done trying to make the Surface thing work. I'm getting an iPad. And he showed up with an iPad. And I said, what happened to your Surface? And he said, I'm done. So uh, it is the majority of the devices are uh, iPad or iPad minis. Uh, different ages, different uh, levels, but uh, that's what I have in my class. And really, my class this semester is the first class that actually got to us with the devices because they, they start in the program before they get to me. So uh, it's very exciting for me. For the first time, I don't have to borrow, steal, cheat, and, and, and bribe people. I actually, they just come with it, happy to use it. And uh, so when I thought about this in a wider context, I thought about what, what does it mean when something is about collaboration? This is what I came up with. Um, the ability to have multiple participants editing or responding to each other, some of it has to be in real time. And uh, that's an important component for me because then you can do some class activities and not just out of class activities. Uh, real time or close to it, that was the second part of that. Uh, whenever possible, it's not always possible, but I really do like it when it's cross-platform because that allows me to have somebody with a Surface or somebody with a, with a God help us, an Android device or something like that, uh, be able to interact. And that means that uh, we can do it across programs and not just uh, in my program right now. It's not a problem, but it is a problem when I work with teachers, when we do other things. So that's uh, really nice. Um, more and more. We ask our students to represent things uh, through uh, multimedia products. So we want most of these to be able to handle different formats. We, I want to be able to handle some video, some audio, definitely text, pictures, and all of that. So the more kinds of inputs it has, the likelier it is that I will use it. And um, I do push as much as possible for cloud-based, simply because 
it really does help that it's not dependent on the device. So I'm going to talk about a few of those. And I've got six of them um, as I was working through, because I wanted things that are very, very different from each other. And that's the first thing that I can be used in different ways. And I also wanted to make sure that uh, we represent categories. So behind each one of those, there's probably three or four other options that will do something similar. This is the one I like to use. It doesn't mean you have to use them, but I do like to use those. And if you want to suggest others that would do similar things, uh, that's great. So it's Padlet to do some uh, in-class uh, work that is collaborative. Ask3, which is a video uh, piece, and that's an app. Uh, Google Drive, which I love. A lot of you have probably used Google Drive, so I'm going to talk about it briefly. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, that's fantastic. I'm using, I'm using Google Drive. My biggest problem with Google Drive right now is finding my documents. And that's one of my down things, because I've got thousands upon thousands of documents for my students as assignments. And that's starting to be just a search problem for me, not for them. Talkboard, which is an app. Uh, actually, using the Photos uh, app on uh, the Apple devices through PhotoStream is fantastic to share multiple products, including video and, uh, and pictures, and can be used. Uh, I'll show you just one thing I've done. And then um, I really am trying to use Twitter, and one of the best applications for me to capture what Twitter does in an easily digested format is Flipboard, so I can, I'll, if we get there, I'm not sure. But if we get there, I'll talk about that. So Padlet. How many of you have used Padlet? Wallwisher, Padlet? Uh, if you go to padlet.com, you don't actually have to have. If I can spell, that'll be great. Um, this is what I did in my class on Tuesday. Is it coming up? Painting my wall. OK. This is all the students in my classroom. We did a third of the semester in Czech. And so I said, OK, work in, they worked in small groups. What are the comments? So give me the things you appreciate, things you noticed, and things you wonder about. And we had some rules for the game. And you can see, you can immediately see what's working and what's not working. The what's working is everybody can comment at once, right? That's working. That's not a problem. And all of it shows up. And we'll, we'll try to do that in a second. What's not working is, beyond a certain number of people, it gets really, really busy. And actually, what we've done is, after everybody put their stuff up, we started organizing. So we, I actually put somebody in charge of, OK, let's try to see if there are categories here, and we can overlap them, and we can organize them. So that's something that uh, does occur. And if you have a large class, you probably want to open a few walls. But you can open a few walls and then switch between them so it, without a lot of problems. So that was really easy. And a few things that I noticed immediately when, whenever I use this with students is they take to it really, really quickly. And, and uh, if you look here, if you look, and this is on purpose on my iPad, you can do this on a computer. You can bring in, so you can create this. Uh, I created a new wall, I'm sorry. And if anybody wants to add anything to this. So you can see it's cloud-based. It stays there, despite the fact that I really don't want to look at it anymore. You can see immediately how many people uh, or how many posts we have. They're not necessarily by different people. Uh, who created it? I, create, I do have a profile. But you can create one without actually ever registering for that website. You can create it out of nothing. It stays. I don't know how long it stays, by the way. But you can see this is from two days ago. Um, so you can do that. You can move any of them. If you're the one who created it, you can move any of those uh, things, or you can highlight them. You can share them as well on other devices. Um, what I'd like to do right now is go to the one that we have there. So uh, if you can just log in to padlet.com uh, slash wall slash UNL2014 and just try to post and see what it feels like. So let's try, I think that's what it is. So if you're on your devices, you should be able to log in. 
using that address. I don't know if I have a URL of image. And if you want to play a little bit more, you can also post a link, like I just did. And I can make that. This is something I shared with my students. And then disastrously named it, uh, this is not going to be on the quiz, <laughs> which made them ignore it automatically. It just automatically goes up. No, it's all there, actually, not in real time, but close to real time. As you write it, it will show up. It's a great way to do summaries. It's a great way to organize information. As I said, I did a third of the semester. I have a, a little bit of a funky semester this semester. I'm doing uh, some democratic practices with my students. So this was an exercise in uh, joint decision making and what they think about what we're doing and what's going well and what's not. So it was a great way to do it. Uh, you just click and you paste the link in. So you take that link from somewhere and you post it in. It could be a picture, it could be a website, and that'll show up and you can uh, obviously make it larger or smaller. The owner of the board can control everything on the board, so whoever initiated it, the participants can control only what they've posted. Okay, so you're kind of protected in some ways. And you can control uh, this. Uh, I was thinking the other day about uh, the classroom with the multiple screens down in, uh, what is architecture hall. That's a great place to do some, some work with groups with multiple projectors. Each group has a projector and they're working together and just putting this piece together. Um, putting uh, their thinking together uh, in interesting ways. So there are lots of ways to use that, but you can see here. Yeah, okay. and again, I can, as the person controlling it, I can actually start moving things around and all of that. You can export it as a picture, so you can actually create a snapshot and move it to email or Twitter or anything else. So there are lots of sharing opportunities, but for me, most of it is in actually in the work that happens here in real time, being able to manipulate it, being able to get everybody to contribute. I've got... I've got 30 kids in my classroom, which makes it really hard for everybody to participate all the time. But I find that when we do exercises like this, it's not that everybody participates, but different students participate in different ways. So students who normally do not speak up tend to participate in these ways actually a lot more. And so it's a way to get that in some ways to work. So this is a Padlet. And you can actually, the gallery is kind of fun because you can see what people have created um, usually more multimedia project, but I think that in class actually the text is fantastic as a tool just to organize thinking and uh, to get students interacting and you get a sense of their work in progress as they're working, whereas sometimes in group work you go to a specific group but then everybody else is moving and you're not sure what they're doing or sometimes you are sure what they're doing and it rhymes with uh, Facebook. Students in my class would never be on Facebook. Um, mostly because they have iPads, so I can see exactly what they're doing. I think that's, a, that's one of the advantages for iPads. Ask3 is a fairly new iPad app. It comes from a, a, a really nice company whose name just escaped me. And um, the high points of this one is this is about video sharing. Now, if you have ever used VoiceThread, VoiceThread is a really nice video sharing app. However, on the iPad it has been very clunky and at least our experience with it has been iffy just because it's just slow, students are frustrated with it, uh, we were frustrated with it for a while. Ask3 is uh, fairly sleek, it does things uh, really well, you get 
to input video, but then you get to comment, and you can make the comments in print or in a video. Uh, it is a closed environment, so it's actually really fantastic for us, but it's even better for K-12 teachers who are really concerned about other people being able to see what their students do. Generally, in everything that I do with my students here, I try to make it as open as possible. I think everybody's, uh, not everybody, but a lot of the sentiment out there is, let's close it down, let's not share, and my thinking is, let's share as much as we can. And my students are going to be teachers, and when they go on some of these websites and some of these apps, they're actually finding that a lot of other teachers are creating, and they're saying, this is great, I don't need to create it right now. And my retort to that is, so when you create, make it the same so other people can use what you've created. They can comment on it or they can just reuse it. So that's a, a great way to do that. And actually some of the apps, apps I'm not talking about today, but some of the apps actually create a marketplace. So if you want to try and sell these things, you can too. So if you created something phenomenal, you can try and sell it for 99 cents. And I don't know how much <laughs> success you will have, but uh, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, Low points, this is a platform specific. So right now, there's an iPad app. And I think there's an Android app, or it's coming up. But there's no website. So you can't consume it any other way besides using a mobile device. That's not necessarily bad. And the other low point, of course, that it's closed. So that can be a high point if that's important to you. And sometimes it is. So if they're taking a video of themselves teaching, and then reflecting on that or getting feedback on that, you actually want that closed because when they're experimenting, they're trying new things that might have impact on future employment. That we don't necessarily want that video floating around on the internet. So that's a good way to do it. And I'm going to use, a, to use the app itself. So if you can try and download, it's, it looks like this. And this is actually not my class. So um, my graduate student created this class. But all you need to do to log in is get the class code. The class code is 34540. And then you can very quickly create a video. So to create a video, you need to go back and go to create. And this is what I love about the iPad. All not all, but many of the screencasting apps are super simple, as in it doesn't take much. So you can bring a photo, choose from library, or take photo. Let's take a photo. All right, so we can take a photo and then use photo, and it becomes the background. And then all you have to do is press the red button, and now I've got the picture, and I can use the different tools, so I can use a, the arrow tool, and I can use the circle tool for Dan, and things like that, and I can talk about it and store that, and then I can clear it and create a new page. I can pause and then restart the video so you don't have to produce it all at once, and eventually I'm done. And so I need a title, and this is... Uh, Right? And now I can upload it. So you see very few buttons, not sophisticated. I think that's really important in the screencasting. With my students, I know they get really, two things happen in complicated screencasting. One is they get really apprehensive about it and they get really hung up on all the buttons. So uh, I don't know if you know, there's something called TouchCast, which is great, but it has lots of buttons and lots of options, and you can do this and that. So now, instead of creating a meaningful product, you're spending time learning all the buttons, figuring out how to make it snazzier, and that's not really where I want at least my students to be, because my students, when I talk to them about creating videos, one of the reasons I talk to them about this is when I want them to start flipping their classrooms, and I want them to create mini lessons, and when I do that, I really don't want it to be super fancy. I really want it to be basic. Why? Because I want them to do it. And if it's going to take you an hour and a half to make a five minute vi a video for instruction, you're probably not going to persist. But if it's taking you seven and a half minutes to create a five minute video, you may actually go ahead and do that. And most of the videos that, that I created for my classes are like that. I sit down, I turn it on, 
I do the instruction, I turn it off, I upload it, I send them a link, and I'm done. I don't edit a lot, I don't spend time. I, in a previous life, I did do some video editing, and it takes the time, it takes 10 minutes and turns them into 10 hours without even thinking about it. And you can add this, and you can make this cooler this way, but really for instruction, it's bells and whistles. It's not where the instruction is. So uh, this allows you to do that. And now, is anybody logged into this? What's the number again? Oh, let me, let me see. Three, four, five, four, zero. And you see, I've, I've done it with a number of people. So we've got actually. This is free, the software? This is free. Ask3 is free, a free app. You can say we, we, we're working with people in China. So uh, that's a big part of what, what I'm doing right now. And it's interesting to watch them do some of these things. The Chinese are very, um, are very into making videos. Um, as part of instruction, we're helping them figure out what you do once you have a video, which is a struggle for our teachers as well, K-12 teachers, sometimes a struggle for us. Um, my own personal struggle, I worked with my students today, is saying, okay, I made a video to explain everything in your assignment, yet you come here and it's very clear that you haven't watched your vi the video. And so uh, that's part of the challenge. But here is where, for me, a lot of it is. So are you able to log in? Is there somebody able to go in? Maybe I need to refresh this one. Maybe G has to approve you or something. So I was able to do this before. Oh, somebody logged in. Yes. So it works. Yes. You know, there's always that moment where you're like, it worked until now, but now it's not going to work. So one of the things that anybody that's in, anybody that's in can create a video or watch somebody else's video and then comment. How do you get it? It opened up a new classroom for me instead of going into Europe. You probably registered as a teacher? Did you do that? So you have to go out again? I think so. And then when you go to bulletin board, you can see other people's work. And so let's go to present that I just created. Now you can watch it. And now, if I want to make a comment, I can make a comment in print, or I can make actually a comment as a video. So now I'm at the same place, same board, but now I'm making the video. So I'm saying, well, really, you should have focused more here. Right? And that's it. That's my comment. So you can do this as an instructor, although most of what I do is actually peer feedback. So they're giving feedback to each other on their videos and ideas to enhance them. So I've added this comment. And now you can see that when you see that larger video, that comment is there and the person who made, who made the original video can access it and see exactly what I said. And more than that, they see exactly where in that movie that comment fits. So it's not just a general comment, but it's just like writing on student papers right next to the thing you want to comment on. You know, we circle it and we say this and this. This is the same tool, just with video, which makes it fantastic. Because on other apps that make screencasting, there is no option to actually have that conversation and not just a general comment about this whole video was great because there's always a place for comments but here you can target it and more than that you can actually make a short video and more than that capture that audio going in and this is where the change is for me I'm trying to teach my students how to do these things first of all because it's a good way to learn the second reason is because they need to teach kids who will graduate in 2030 right they are preparing those next 
They're, in two years, they will go into the classroom. They will have kids. Those kids are graduating 20, 30, and beyond. Some of us are hoping to be retired by then. But uh, those are kids that will grow up in a very different world that is this multimedia word, world. I mean, we all are in it. But we can pretend we're not for a while longer, right? And, uh, and complain about libraries moving the books away and all of that. But that's the reality they're going to be in. And I'm trying to give my teachers as much of a taste of this as possible because for them to teach going forward, they need to, to really think about this, interact with it, and feel comfortable at least to a degree with it. And it's not all easy. And you know, everybody is always the first time they do video. Uh, you can ask Dan. <laughs> Every time you do video for the first time, uh, you don't look right and you don't sound right and all of these uh, aspects about your appearance that you, you're not paying attention to and suddenly you have that mirror in front of you. So kid, uh, my students at least get really apprehensive. But after a few times, we all get over it. And they do too. And uh, their products get a lot better. And now that I'm having this, uh, this group who moved with devices, I actually seen that they have already created some. So this is a great way to push them to the next level. And how do we respond to that? And not just do the first time you create. How many of you work in Google Drive? All of you. How many of you use comments and student feedback? So what I use Google Drive, I mean, Google Drive is a great receptacle, but that's true of Dropbox and all of the other ones. The great thing for me about Google Drive is we're all working on the same document at the same time. I do a lot of my uh, professional writing uh, like that. But with students, what I use Google Drive for is actually I use the commenting very extensively, and not just my comments. All of the assignments they do, they first do fe peer feedback. So they share their document with somebody else. They get feedback. They do editing based on that peer feedback. And that has been very powerful. Because that peer feedback works for both students. You get comments on your paper, but you also get to read somebody else's paper and realize what they've done well that you've totally forgot about. So it saves me a lot of work. Really, it's all about making it work. But a so I'll just give you an example of something we're doing now. You can see that I have 400 apps, right? I've been criticized for that before, so it's OK. You can, you can say that. And again, I have a huge number of apps. You go to the share with me, and you go to, which one was it? So this is a, this is a st students I have right now. And this is peer review, so you can actually activate the comments and uh, see what comments were made and what the students did about them. Students originally try to mark as resolved. You know, it feels like you're done. I'm actually trying to get them to stop to do that from doing that for two reasons. One is you get a message for every mark as resolved. You get a message in your email box. Uh, you can disconnect it, but I actually want it. But the second thing is I actually want the peer feedback to be visible, because then I can see if the peer feedback in me is meaningful, which is part of their task and their participation in the class. And the second thing is I can see how they responded to that peer feedback. So there's that layering of multiple participants going uh, here. So, and you can access the uh, comments and add your own comments to it. So again, this is creating this multi-layered product that is so helpful for students. And you know, in large classes, the peer feedback is fantastic because it comes a lot quicker than my feedback. And then students don't feel like they've posted something and nobody's paying attention for three weeks while I go and present in different places and all of that. I try to be good about it, but you know, there's a point in the semester where things start breaking down. And I start thinking about my own mortality. By the comment here, I think we're all there, almost. But yes, I've got a, a lot. So if, if you've done a Google Drive, you know how this works. Um, the Google Drive app 
keeps getting better. So a while back, about six months ago, the comments <coughs> wouldn't show up. And if they did show up, it was wrong. So they keep improving it. I'm very happy with it. And right now, I wouldn't change it. And again, one of the advantages, of course, it is cross-platform. You can use any device for that. And, and your student, my students can as well. And that's really, really helpful. Uh, the few things that people have noticed, and that's very true of this app, is beyond four or five people at once. So if they're creating a document together, you cross that four or five people down, and the app starts closing, and the website starts closing, and things happen. So if they're creating in class, and we do use that for in class assignments as well, if they are using it at the same time, you want to make sure that group size does not get too big, because it, it can get really frustrating awfully fast. And uh, I'm, I actually have some teachers using it in elementary schools, and they've had the same problem as well. Um, the one thing I'm struggling with, and that may be just because I've got about four or 5,000 documents shared with me at this point, is that if it is not organized well, good luck finding things. I mean, there is a search function, but for some reason, I can't find the things I'm looking for consistently. And um, especially on the app, it's really hard to organize them in specific ways. Uh, what I currently do to solve that, just because I like uh, Google, Do uh, Google Docs and that collaboration so much, I do two things. All of my students create a folder and put all of their assignments in a shared folder. And that makes it easier because then you're not hunting for a single, um, for a single document in a semester with multiple documents. You're hunting for that student's folder. And what I do then is I star all of their folders. So I know that they're in my favorites. I unstar all of my previous students. And that makes it manageable. Because if not, my students send me about probably um, 10 documents a semester, sometimes more if they're uploading supporting documents, pictures, videos, whatever. whatever uh, you, uh, whatever they, they deem appropriate, and so it can get to a large number. I teach in the summers in the Reading Center, and so students share two documents a day, each one of the students, so you can do the math, 30 students, four days a week, times two, it's 240 a week, five weeks, you know, just that, just that one course produces over a thousand documents, so it is very important to manage it in that way. What it does give me, though, long term, is I actually have access to papers down history lane because <laughs> students don't unshare. And so it's becoming a, a really nice way to look at the development of uh, the way students are uh, responding to some of my assignments and all of that. Because we do research with our students and we actually have permission to use uh, some of those uh, products, it allows us to do some interesting research without having to go to the students and say, hey, can you share that again? Or having to find some Blackboard uh, you know, course that <coughs> is not accessible anymore and it's stored somewhere. But uh, that would be more pain than it's worth. So that, those are ways to kind of look at it over time. Uh, I am a lot into uh, collecting just consistent data of my students or the students in the program. It's not just my personal students, but that helps. So uh, that's a way to connect uh, with Google Drive. Talkboard, and that I do want you to, uh, to download. Have, has anybody worked with Talkboard before? That's good. Found something nobody does. This is Talkboard. And I have to invite you, as far as I can recall. I'm loading projects. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Have you ever had students with Google Drive that have not used it before? And yes, so all the time. Kind of instructions of some kind? All the time. There are lots of good instructional videos online. You go on YouTube, you say instruction for Google themselves. They have a lot of good, this is how you use this. I actually do a lot of peer coaching. I went to, up in my class a week and a half ago, and I said, OK, how many of you don't know, have never used Google Drive, or feel not very confident about it? About half raised their hand, and I said, OK, this half, look at this other half. Work together. You can figure this out. And part of this is, any workplace they get, it might not be Google Drive. It might be some other technology. But you're not very likely to get a lot of formal instruction. When ki my kids walk into Lincoln Public Schools, Lincoln Public Schools have shifted student papers from a certain grade on 
to Google Drive. They have shifted a lot of the student data. They bought into Google Drive, so they, they actually have their own domain and all of that very organized. It's not just their own private ones. And they have a lot of the data when they're tracking students who are struggling. It's all on Google Drive, and you share that with all the teachers, so we are all sharing the same information. So they actually, this is a job requirement. And when I talk to administrators, and I think anybody teaching in a profession, I mean, we're a professional program. So we talk to our constituents, principals and superintendents. What do they tell me? When I have a new teacher come in, they'd better know this, because I actually want them to help my veteran teachers get in and do this. And that's part of what I sell my students. Is this is basic. I mean, when they say, well, you know, who's using iPads? And, and I say to them, you know, when was the last time you went to a, to a coffee shop, really? And they're all using an iPad connected to the, what is it, a Square or to some other device that does all the work that a big till used to do. And you just slip it to you, you sign it with your finger, and there you go. And, and all of these things, this is, this is what's going on in the professional world. And we're, we're seeing a, you know, a large quantities of mobile devices in schools. We're seeing them in professional settings. This is where it's going, and this is what employers will want from you, and this is, in a way, they're what they're expecting from you because you're young. They're assuming. They may be falsely assuming, but if we want you to get that job, and I've actually heard about people who didn't get a job because they were really apprehensive about technology, and the principal said, that's for me a, a non-starter. So um, that's one of the ways we bring them in. Is this is not a course requirement. This is a real-life requirement. And that helps some struggle. And we go through a few iterations until they get there. But they, the point is, we do need to get there. And you know, they complain, but uh, it does uh, something like that. And so if I open this, I, oh, that's my second board. Uh, invite, who can I invite? So I can invite you by email or by message. So I need some, uh, somebody to invite. Who wants to be invited? What email? <laughs> Do you want to just put in the email? Does anybody else want to come in? Would that work? Send. So let's just do that. And you can just write or draw. I like the way it reacts to, to the finger or even to a stylus. I'm not a big stylus person because I lose them all the time. So I've given up on them. I also think that we just need to learn to use our fingers. We're back to where we started in some ways. <laughs> but uh, I do like that. Were you able to log in? I should see your picture when you log in, if we share the right one. Yeah. So you can see who, who the participants are, and then different participants can contribute to the board. And this I haven't used in class yet, but my guess is just from the size of the canvas, not too many, because we'll just run out of room. But it is a good way to make plans, to draw, to write, to do any of that stuff. Now, this does not allow to bring anything in, really. So there, it's very limited to what's on the board. It's really, for me, it's a brainstorming. So the few times I've used it, I used it with my research team. And we just, when we brainstorm, we use that uh, fairly effectively to do quick collaboration and uh, in a free format. So I'm, ve I'm very much a, um, an arrow and square and circle guy. So this works for me really, really well for my style. It doesn't necessarily work for people who want everything very, very organized. So different apps would do that. So this is, this is talk board. How am I doing on time? It's a time thing. I don't know how I am. OK. Oh, I have a timer, actually. Um, photos. So photos is a way to share. A, most of you have probably used the Photos app, right? Have you created a photo stream and shared it? 
And what I do is, for example, at the beginning of class, it turns out my kids did not know each other. So usually I get groups of kids who know each other. I created a stream so we can share everybody's name so they can learn each other's name without constantly asking, who are you? They're going to spend, they spend a lot of time together. We spend two days, three hours a day, twice a week. And then they spend two days at the schools, full days. They're in adjacent classrooms, not in the same classroom. But not knowing somebody's name becomes a problem. And they admit it. So what we've done is we've created this stream and we shared it with everybody. And it's their names and, uh, you know, their photos. And now we're going to the next level and we're actually going to share photos of their students at work. So they're each in a different site. They're taking photos of their kids. They're putting it in the same photo stream and everybody can see student products basically in real time. So that's uh, how I've been using photos to do some uh, interesting sharing. And you can, when you send them, actually add comments to them so you can actually give a little bit of feedback. Now, that's clunky, and that's not necessarily where I want to be. But it's a very quick way to share, this is what's going on right now in my project. I would just want to send you a heads up. And um, at times, I don't see them for uh, quite a few days. So this is a good way to, uh, to have that happen. How does that work with your practical placements? If you've got, you know, you've got kids under 13. We, we tell them how to take pictures. We take pictures from the back. And we look most, more at student products than faces or anything that would be recognizable. Yes. And actually, a lot of the schools they're working with have the kids sign. Yeah. But I still tell them you don't want to necessarily have those floating you know, around. The yes. They, they do it from elementary all the way, at least Lincoln Public Schools. It depends on the school system. Most of mine are in Lincoln Public Schools, and they all sign. Or they don't. Um, that being said, again, we're really not interested in kids' faces. So often, it's a second student taking a picture of a student delivering a lesson. So all the kids are looking at the student. So we're seeing all of their backs. And then we're seeing the face of the practicum students. But yes. And that's part of learning, by the way. Again, for me, how you behave and what are the boundaries in, a, in those settings is a really important lesson because these technologies are all around. And they sometimes stumble with these technologies. They always have phones. They have their uh, iPads right now. They take pictures all the time. They, they tweet. They text. They do all of that. So that discussion about what's, what's allowable and what's not, what's OK and what's not, is actually a really good discussion. Because you can get fired re awfully fast making those mistakes. And once that happened, it actually is, becomes really hard to get rehired. Because once that information floats around, nobody wants to be that principal that hired the teacher that made that mistake. And it's fine to give somebody a second chance, but the principal is always thinking, if that happens again, people will come to me and say, it's already happened. You knew it already happened. How can you do that? And when we can just as my students said, this, um, we were talking this morning, I was asking them, what do you do when you don't understand what you read? And they said, I Google it. You know? When you can be Googled and they can find all of your mistakes and all of the news about how you got fired, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. And, they, and we work quite hard with them about their uh, digital footprint as far as professional, and their professional lives are concerned. Um, I've seen teachers uh, fired for that in, in uncomfortable ways. So, um, Again, that's for us the digital citizenship thing, both thinking about their students, but thinking about themselves and how do you protect yourself and how do you sell yourself. The last one is Twitter. How many of you are using Twitter in class? In class. Ah, that's the trick. Um, I know a lot of students are actually apprehensive about following or being followed by an instructor, and that's perfectly fine. If they're oversharing their personal lives, I really don't need to be part of that oversharing. Uh, it's just like Facebook for me. Um, certain things I'm, I'm better not knowing, better off not knowing. But I do use Twitter at times. And what I've done is I've created a few hashtags. And basically what I say is whenever you share something about the class, use a class hashtag. In my case, it's TAC311. Uh, we haven't started it this semester. Uh, but the way I like using it is by using Flipboard. Flipboard is one of the first apps I ever got. And, and it's the oldest one that I still have, I think. Uh, 
I go in my history of, you can s organize your apps from oldest to, to newest, and that's in the first few weeks of uh, use, uh, three iPads ago, actually. And I still use it. And what I think uh, Flipboard does well, besides give you a lot, is get all your streams together, but more than that, this is the hashtag we use for our uh, videos. But uh, what it does allow you to do is follow a specific hashtag and get that stream into. And what I like about it, let's get something a little bit heftier. <coughs> so let's get uh, Edutopia, which I do follow. Um, what I like about it is these all started as tweets, but when they come into Flipboard, they actually become uh, magazine-like. And you get at least the beginning of the post, so you know, oh, this is something I want to read, or this is something that is not enough. And just by pressing on it a little bit further, you get the full story, and then you can respond to it, retweet it, or uh, just let it, let it go. So it's a quick way <coughs> to organize and have students actually react to each, other po each other's post without necessarily following somebody. Again, because they feel uncomfortable. My students have felt uncomfortable about uh, having that relationship on Twitter, and I'm fine with that. I don't need to make them feel uncomfortable. And if they're, and the <laughs> truth is, I definitely don't want to follow them if they're tweeting what they ate for breakfast and where they're waiting and what are they doing. I really do not. It's not just that I don't want to know. It's too much information and that I can't do anything <laughs> with. So I, I stay away from that, and I use hashtags. So this is, these are my six ways to uh, collaborate in class, so trying to make it as interactive as possible using technology. And again, I look at it both ways. I look at it as a way to enhance learning, but I also look at it as a way to think about ways to act professionally. So what are some ways you can share, so learn? What are some things as a teacher you would like to use or as a professional you would like to use? I've got a, a principal who's a, my graduate student, and he thinks about what does it look like from a principal's level, and how does he share with his teachers as he's trying to get them on board with technology in this case. So uh, it's a great room to have that discussion, not just as a way to learn, but actually as a way to act professionally. And that's that. If there are any questions. Or if you want to share something else you're doing, because this is at least partially supposed to be about sharing. So what else are you I, using? I thought maybe I'd share with you. You mentioned earlier one of your frustrations is all the email notifications that you're getting. Yeah, you can turn it off. Actually, there's a better way I just discovered. Uh -huh. um, oh. You can teach your Google Mail you can teach it how to immediately put a particular address into another folder, another tab. Mm -hmm. So you create a new tab on your Gmail, mm -hmm. and then the first few times you get the notification from that community or that URL, you click, drag, drop into that tab. A pop-up menu will show up and it will ask you, do you always want to put emails from this notification into this tab? And you answer yes. And then it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> Good. But you have to teach it to do that. So if you have 75 students, you have to do it 75 times, and then for the rest of the semester, you don't have to worry. I just discovered that because I had 1,400 emails <laughs> that <laughs> me. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, something I'm trying new this semester is using LinkedIn for a mm -hmm. discussion group. and. I've not tried that before. The students are loving it, or graduate students, but mm -hmm. they love it a lot more than they have liked Blackboard for that. So I don't totally know what I'm doing, but so far it's going to be I don't okay. think anybody totally knows what they're doing. And I found we started a group on LinkedIn for technology, I think two years back as part of our, uh, we do a lot of collaborations with schools, with K-12 schools. And we started that, and it wasn't going anywhere, and suddenly in the last few months it started getting some volume going. So I, I find LinkedIn very interesting. Um, I found that my undergraduates are not. My graduate students are all on LinkedIn, so that, uh, that was great. And again, I think Blackboard is frustrating because Blackboard is clunky, although discussion board on the app is fantastic, and it's getting better 
on other aspects. It's lousy as an instructor because you can't grade. I mean, there's so many things that don't work well. But uh, Blackboard disappears. And the great thing about all of these other social media is if you're looking for there, it's still there. Of course, the downside is if you're looking for there, it's still there. <laughs> so it depends on how much you, what kind of discussions you have. But uh, it is, uh, I find too that, that they don't necessarily like Blackboard for these things. They have other selves, and it makes more sense in that, in that way. Other social selves. So, you know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when I started with Blackboard, there wasn't <laughs> much traffic outside of email. But now, with all of the uh, social media identities, it makes less sense, I think. <coughs> other things to share, come on. What are you doing? I need to learn something new about sharing. Because I'm, I'm still, uh, to be completely honest, I'm still struggling with this, and my students are often struggling with this. You know, they've never given anybody feedback on <coughs> Google Drive, even if they've used Google Drive before. And, and as, as I said, half of them did. But none of them have ever used the common tool. Almost none. Two did. But so this is all new learning for them, and they're frustrated at times. And that's probably good for them and good for me. Not necessarily for my course evaluations, but for me. Okay. That's it. <laughs>